welcome. Uh, we are um, very happy to be here. I'm Jane Onora. I'm Jeff Fraser. We um, are both part of the mediation group. We call it TMG. And Jeff and I have been doing mediations, family mediations, for probably over 20 years. We've probably done hundreds of mediations. We are both extremely passionate about the benefits of mediation and letting families know how much it can, how helpful it can be. Uh, this was originally going to be part of a speaker series at the um, at the senior center, and then COVID hit. And since then, we've all had to learn new things. We've done all our family mediations uh, since March uh, via Zoom. And this is another thing we've had to learn, which is to create a webinar. Um, families often go through very difficult um, times. Every family has difficult moments. And what often happens is that they either don't talk about those difficulties and they go underground, or if a crisis hits that makes the problems bubble up, they, get, they can get somewhat adversarial, threaten, threaten each other with lawsuits or um, n n contact lawyers and make the Con the conflict even worse. What mediation is able to do, it's basically very simple, it's assisted negotiation. And what mediation is able to do is to help build on the strengths, first of all, build on the strengths of the family rather than sort of stir up the most vulnerable parts of, of family interaction. But it's also able to help the family come together and change what was felt like an insurmountable conflict, change it from that to a project that they can all work together to resolve. And research shows that mediated uh, agreements, there, for mediated agreements, there's much more compliance than when some kind of situation, when it goes to court and a judge orders some kind of solution, which is usually just a black and white solution. There's not a lot of Grace, mediation is a creative process and um, it helps families create new boundaries or safe boundaries so that they can proceed, move forward. It's not therapy. We're not there to help you understand the roots of the conflict. We're there to help you move forward, make decisions and get have success in resolving whatever conflict is brought to us. The kinds of conflicts that we often see, especially in the, in, for, for elders, is in families trying to decide how to deal with the issue of elder independence, often elder care, and even more often how to help families, adult siblings resolve um, disputes after the parents have died in terms of how to divide up the estate. Jeff, do you wanna say something at this point? Just that um, we, our, our backgrounds are, uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer as well as a mediator and Jane is a therapist as well as a mediator. And, but you're, but our, when we work together, we aren't providing therapy or legal advice. Our day jobs just inform us um, because things come up family conflict that Jane is very comfortable helping with. Legal issues, which I don't provide legal advice, but it helps to have that background when, when the conflict arises in a adversarial and sometimes uh, threatens to become litigation. Also the solutions to some conflict can arise from a background in law and knowing what can be done and what can't be done. Um, and uh, so that, that keeps us on sometimes on track on what the possible solutions are. And also maybe uh, we, I can propose certain solutions that other people have used, legal solutions. Um, 
excellent point. I forgot to mention that for almost all the family mediations, we do create a team of mediators made up of someone with a background in mental law and someone with a background in um, me background in mental health and someone with a background in law. And for some cases, someone with a background in public health um, that our team is made up of th those people um, with those kinds of backgrounds. Um, Jeff, Jeff and I thought that what would make the most sense would be to talk about a case that we did many years ago, maybe, I don't know, seven, 10 years ago, it was a long time ago, of a family in conflict, and then um, highlight what, how the process, hopefully through describing this case, we can highlight how the process works and give you a better understanding. So I'll start, and Jeff, interrupt me if, if I've left something out. Um, the family was a family that came to us three years after the mother died and it was made up of five adult siblings, one of whom, the youngest, lived with the mother for 10 years before she died and was the primary uh, caretaker of the mother, especially in the last few years of the mother's life. So she um, lived there, never paid rent, but, but did help out with all the doctor appointments, handling all the medicine, handling all the, be the being the contact person for the medical professionals for all the difficult medical decisions that had to be made. The other thing that's important to know about this woman is that she was an artist. That was a very big part of her identity. And it was something that um, she felt the other family members didn't fully appreciate because she didn't make very much money being an artist, but that was still very, very important to her. Uh, the other, uh, the family, I think three of the family members lived in Massachusetts, two lived out of state and the family was, um, the other siblings were very frustrated with this sister. The mother had died three years before. The main asset in this family situation was the house that, that it was the family house that all the children were raised in. And it was um, for different family members important to get because of their family situation or their economic situation, it was important to get the money out of that house. But this younger sister, absolutely refused to move. She had spent pretty much her whole life there. There was a period of time when she tried to move out, it did not work out, and that's when she moved back to live with the mother. Um, so they couldn't figure out what to do. They didn't want to evict their sister, but they kind of felt stuck. She, went, she also had a very serious anxiety disorder, and when she got anxious, she would withdraw, and she would refuse to take phone calls. She would refuse to if somebody tried to drop over, she would not let them in. She was um, difficult for the other family members to, to deal with. And they all felt that she was the baby in the family, that the mother had babied her her whole life, and that they didn't want to be in the position of having to do that and take care of her for the rest of her life. So they felt very stuck and they came to us. Um, we, one of the things that we're able to do as mediators is allow people to tell their story. It doesn't happen in court. In court, a lawyer speaks for you. In mediation, you speak for yourself. And simply having a neutral listen to them, hear what they have to say, hear their perspective, and not be judging them is powerful. It's a powerful part of the process. Also, the um, they, most people come to mediation and they come with very firm positions. This is how it has to happen. The house has to get sold, end of story, and she's got to move out. But underneath that is often some kind of ambivalence about the, the, the subtleties, the complexities of the situation. And what mediation is able to do is allow people to talk about that safely. So they're not giving away the whole store by saying, yeah, I know my sister has special problems. We don't want to be, we don't want to be evicting her. They're not, they're not giving everything away, but admitting that and allowing that into their consciousness. Jeff, is there more we should talk about about this case? 
this setup of this case? Well, the, the legal uh, setting is one in which um, the house, the taxes, utilities, et cetera, of the house uh, was in negative numbers every, every month for, and this went on for, for a long time. So the, although the house was appreciating, um, the burden of paying all these carrying costs fell on the other four siblings. And, um, and so they wanted to liquidate this place because they lost money every month. Their sister, who, uh, you know, didn't want to leave, refused to leave, but she, she, was, she was in a situation where between her mental health issues and her lack of funds, it's hard to picture how she could have solved this problem by simply moving like the other resident, like the other siblings could have. So the next thing that would and happen- And also describe what would happen if it did go to court. Right, so we have this uh, very old fashioned, uh, it's as old as property law, uh, proceeding called a petition to partition the real estate, petition to partition. And what that means is co-owners of real estate, any one co-owner has the right to go to court and seek after quite a bit of time and, and legal process in order that the house be sold or the real estate be sold and the, pro and the net proceeds distributed to the owners. Um, that is litigation, that takes time. The house is sold under somewhat difficult circumstances. So you don't get the money you do if you sold it on the open market. So it's kind of a doomsday machine for, for the parties. They have this option. They've been told this by their lawyers and they seek mediation because they know that, that they don't want to do that or they don't want to have to do that. Is there a way around that? So that's the legal setting we're facing and, and the, parties, the parties are aware of that, um, and, that and that motivates them. Although when they present for mediation, they're still thinking there must be some other way that we can do this um, without going to the court and also each party getting exactly what they want. So therefore that's their position going in. No, we're gonna do it this way. We're gonna do it and I want my share and, 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 and unfortunately the, the sister, the, the younger sister is gonna just have to lose and, and be out. So they, ca they carry their hard and fast positions into the mediation and then that, that, that's our job now to figure out how to manage that. Right, and, and some of the things that we do to help people think a little differently, some of the um, ways that we talk to them about how to think about the problem is to, to, to break it up and to incorporate things like time, like, well, it, I guess we could live with holding on to the house for X amount of time if the sister would actually be willing to move, but then we have to talk about what would make her willing to be willing to move. And when we spoke to the sister, it was clear that while she was terrified of moving, she was also terrified and felt incapable of maintaining the house. She didn't have the money. She didn't want to have to, to it was a large house. And um, she just didn't, didn't feel like she could manage the whole thing. Um, we, we're able in the process of working with these people to change the conversation. So instead of it being, this sister is problematic, it became, how can we all work together to make something different happen out of this situation? And the other skill or uh, uh, way that we help people think about the case is, is what Jeff just referenced to. If you don't solve the case here, you're, you, we have to remind them of what their alternatives are. And as I said earlier, there in this case, there would be kind of two alternatives. One to go to court, which as Jeff just described is incredibly expensive and painful on many levels. Or again, swallow the issue and live angry, resentful, and, and um, nothing happens. So we were able to help them divide up the issue into, okay, if the sister were, were gonna move, 
how would she manage it? And one of the siblings said, well, I live in Massachusetts. I'd be more than happy, ha happy to help her look for places. Another sibling who had the most money of any of the others said, I would, I would help, I would co-sign a, a mortgage or I would help her um, buy the property and then I could get repaid once we actually sold the house. Um, the sister was able to admit to us that if she, whenever she thought about moving, one of her fantasies was that she moved to uh, an artist's community, maybe something like Rockport, where the, she would feel more comfortable, more at home. And in fact, having a condo where she didn't have to worry about snow removal and, and leave removal and all those kinds of things would actually be a relief to her. So over the period of the, the day where we worked with these folks, we were able to construct a solution that they all could buy into in which the sister would be helped in this process of what was totally overwhelming to her. And in the end, they were, uh, you know, she said, but how am I gonna move all my artwork? And the, the family actually said, well, maybe we can have some of your artwork, which made her extremely happy. Um, they, where they had resented all the years of rent-free living that she had, they suddenly were beginning to talk about, well, she did take care of our mom, and she did a good job with that, and it saved us a lot of hassles. So suddenly the conversation shifted, and they started to cooperate, and they started to redefine the problem, not as sell this house, and she's got to, she's so stubborn, she's got to figure it out, but how can we help her through this process? Jeff, one, of, one, of the, um, one of the things that happens at mediation is uh, people are, bring their feelings, but often with their siblings there, they don't express their feelings, especially those feelings which are, are more conciliatory because they are in an adversarial, they've been in an adversarial Excellent. setting, uh, a posture. And so here we are in a mediation and now there are third parties, the mediators, who are asking questions and, and, and innocent questions and questions that um, the are parties often, right. they, they don't want to sound so harsh. Uh, but in any event, what happens is that certain information leaks out where, for instance, one of the siblings said, and this is, so what would be, what would be a good way to, to find out? Well, uh, the, what the question someone has to ask is, wait a minute, she took care of the mother all those years. Does she, isn't that worth something? Isn't, nobody's mentioned that. No, we as mediators don't want to jump in and, and put our finger on the scale. However, if you keep people talking long enough, they feel more comfortable telling third parties something like that. So at some point, uh, without us prompting that, uh, we, we just ask, you know, so who she took care of your mother all the time. And then, so, then one of the siblings said, well, yeah, on, on some level, she did us a big, she helped us a lot because that burden fell on her. So boom, that's a little bit of a leak of a whole different conversation. So okay. that whole conversation then sprouts and people are saying, yeah, that's true. Um, and they might say, I didn't think of it that way. Or they, they probably have thought of it that way. But in any event, now we're having a different conversation. So really? do we then say, well, let's get the whiteboard out and find out what that was worth all those years, et cetera. No, if we had to, we might, but, but usually people are, no, have some sense of how much, it's helped exactly. and that triggers their sense of obligation somewhat to their mother, to their sister, to try and make a, have a more balanced result that, that honors the, their youngest sister's situation. And, could under, be. and yeah. understand, we're not saying that at the end of all this, everything is, you know, happy, thereafter they all live happily thereafter one big happy family though it is at, it but what it has done is move them past this stuck place which is not insignificant financially or emotionally and it's allowed them to 
perhaps have something different of a relationship. And oftentimes when, after we've come to agreement and Jeff is in another room on the computer writing up the agreement, I'm sitting with the family and they're suddenly telling me happy stories of family life in the house and how mom used to do this and they're laughing and dad used to do that. And the whole tone is different than when they enter. So it's something has changed. Is it going to make everything, all the negative feelings go away? No. Is it going to um, mean that they'll never have another kind of conflict? like this? Probably not. It, because again, it's not getting to the roots of the conflict, it's moving forward. But sometimes it does, it does make a big difference. And um, so I hope that gives you a flavor for how family mediation can work and really make a big difference for families. Well, yeah. I just want to say, so the, so the result was, um, after the one sibling, pointed out that she did them all a big favor. The other siblings uh, sort of acknowledged that. So then we were, then the conversation became, well, what do we do now? And one of the solutions was, in addition to each of them getting one fifth of, from the sale, um, as Jane pointed out, one of the sisters was willing to advance some money against that so that she could move. And then, then the other parties each felt the little obligation to say, well, I can do this or I can do that. And so we had an agreement that it would all happen over a certain period of time and that they would uh, instruct the lawyers uh, to make that happen. And so the resolution was one that felt more fair uh, than what they expected. They expected, they wanted, they wanted each, everybody wants to win, right? Everybody wants to get their way, but when it gets when the issues get reframed like that then they actually feel okay about the compromise because they see where how it, it arises out of um of fairness and and i would say creative process which the courts the courts are very black and white but mediation can be very creative the moment where one of the siblings said i love some of your art in my house it it like opened up it opened up windows that had been closed. So um, I hope that does give you a flavor. Um, we have never, uh, we were originally were hoping to do this in a, in a live presentation, but we've not, <laughs> that's beyond our skills, our Zoom skills at the moment. So um, we, we have presented in, in numerous settings and we get certain kinds of questions um, either about this case or, you know, at presented this case or other cases. And so we thought we would present those, uh, try and answer those questions. And at the end, if we haven't answered your question, you can, um, you can either um, contact us at the mediationgroup.org um, and the phone number is 617-277-9232. I'm going to try and share the screen at the end and put on our website so you can see that. Um, but if, if I'm unable to do that, then, then feel free to call us and we will answer any questions that you have. Um, so here's, here's a list of the questions that we, um, have, we often get. Um, the first one is, um, in my family, some of us actually agree to mediation, but two won't. Two just won't even talk about it. So how do you get everyone to agree to come in the first place? Um, and the way that I usually answer that is from experience, we've learned that cold calling from us is not something that works. So we'll get an intake call from one of the siblings and they'll explain the situation. And I let them know that we are open to speaking to all of them on intake, or even we, these days we could do a Zoom uh, intake. Um, and that um, one of the things that sometimes works really well is to tell the hesitant siblings that they are not signing on for a long-term process and that they can, we can set up an initial session and if, they're, if they feel that, that, will, that that's helpful and will we'll, we'll agree to that, and then they feel like once they meet us, no, these people aren't going to be helpful to us. They don't have to come again. 
it's part of what we mean to say mediation, which we probably, I don't know that we mentioned at the beginning. It's a voluntary process. It's voluntary in two ways. It's voluntary in agreeing to participate, and it's also voluntary in the, with regard to um, uh, the, the conclusion. The, the, we're not judges, we're not imposing anything. The, the, if they come to resolution, it's a voluntary resolution. They've, they've come, they've agreed to, to what they, whatever the resolution looks like. Um, and that often, often just letting people know that they're not committing, like maybe how people think about therapy is a very long-term process. This is, not, this is not that. Want to add anything to that question, Jeff? Well, the yeah, the voluntary, we use the word voluntary a lot because it, it's the antidote to, to people's feeling uh, trapped or being controlled, controlled by other family members, controlled by a third party. Um, controlled by the lawyers. Yeah, this is very personal. This is very private. So they're already out there talking about something to strangers that they just as soon resolve some other way. But, but knowing that they can, and we say, you know, you can walk out of the room in the middle of the media, nothing is binding. This is either, you're either gonna find this helpful and, and, and work toward a resolution or not. And, and if, I, it, if you don't like it, you just walk away. We're, we don't have any power. And I would add to that, that probably, I would say 85% or maybe more of our cases do settle. So, um, you know that, but there's 15% that don't. So one has, we always make we always make reference to that at the beginning of the mediation. Um, another question that we get is in family mediations: Is it possible for us to speak separately to the mediators? Is it possible for us to tell our story not in front of everyone else because we don't think that we will be free to say everything we want to say. And um, the answer to that is absolutely. And even on Zoom, you can, we can move people to, to separate rooms and they can tell us their story in the privacy of that room. The other parties don't have to hear. And maybe Jeff can talk a little bit about, in general, about confidentiality and how it works in mediation with regard to the private caucuses, but also uh, in general in terms of mediation. Yeah, you know, generally speaking, there's a statute, it's 30 years old, which provided for the confidentiality of anything that's said or produced at a mediation. So that also can make people feel more comfortable because they're, 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 they're worried about litigation, they're worried about, their lawyers have said, don't talk to that person, um, but their lawyers do know, if, if they have lawyers, that anything that's said in a mediation cannot be brought to court. We can't be subpoenaed as mediators. The, the parties cannot be subpoenaed to say, well, at the mediation, this was said. So it's a, it's a, it's a private window where they can speak more freely in that respect. Secondly, when we have occasion to meet with one party or the other, or, or a faction, two siblings versus uh, a, a, a mother and a, and a third sibling, we, we, um, we say, and this is very common mediation technique, that when we're in this separate room, we're gonna talk about things and some of the things you're gonna wanna tell us, you don't wanna say out loud. In addition to that, you, you want us to know this because it's important to you, but also uh, we will honor the privacy of that conversation because that's, and, and, and why do we do that? Because it is so helpful for the mediators to know what's going on under the surface and, what, and what's driving some of the, some of the, uh, some of the conflict. And in a, in a meeting of, of all the parties, a lot, some of that doesn't get said. Also, when you're in a separate meeting where there's confidentiality, but there's also uh, an attempt to, for the mediators to say, well, what, what, do, what do you want? What kind of, what kind of and this is private, I'm not, we're not gonna go convey it to the other side. What, what, what does resolution look like in your mind? What's important to you? And so an example, 
that come, that I use because it's come up a couple of times. In a sibling, uh, adult sibling situation, one party might say, you know, I don't want to go in and say bad things about my nephew, my sister's son, but he's living in the downstairs apartment where mom is. I don't want him living there. I know things about him. I don't trust him. And uh, it's hard for me to say that in front of my sister, but I, it, and it's also, but it's important to, to me and to my other sibling that, that that stop, that he go. And I don't know what, where to go with this other than um, it's a strong feeling I have. So now we know something. We know, we know what's important to, to that person. One of the things that's important that person, to that person in a resolution. And we know that if possible, we, we don't want to create more conflict by having that person disparage the, the nephew. So we put that away and know it. So it's a, we have a broader concept of the, of, the, of the conflict. And the person feels that they have, they've told us something important about where they stand. Exactly. And if, if they hadn't been able to say that, one could easily imagine that you come up with some solution for whatever they brought to us, and two years later, they're back because the nephew who they, they felt was, was taking drugs and was doing things that they were not happy with, um, you know, the, the, that problem arises. So if we can hear from each individual what, what matters most to them and incorporate it into a final agreement, and also sometimes in, enlarge it, it sounds, um, contradictory, but enlarging the number of issues that we need to deal with can make it easier to solve because there can be give and take on different issues and and ultimately we can come to a resolution. The third question, I'm going to let Jeff handle this one because it's really, a, I think, a, a legal question, which is, if we do come to agreement, is it enforceable? Well, the short answer is yes. Um, if, if it wasn't, what is the point of all this, right? So the parties have, uh, they, they expect, and they actually like the idea of committing this to writing. Um, legally, their agreements often require more lawyering, for instance, uh, more, formal doc more formal agreements, maybe deeds signed, whatever, whatever would be the resolution, the way to wrap this up in a proper legal uh, 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 resolution, and which involves paperwork. However, an agreement is an agreement. And if, and if the parties, if there's a writing that identifies the dispute, and then each party agrees that this is, a, this is our agreement, and one, so two, three, four, five, six, and within those within those agreements, those paragraphs are deadlines by which something's going to happen, and the parties agree tend to agree on that because after what they've been through, deadlines are not the biggest issue; they're just a just kind of a process help. issue. It can help actually, yeah. And, and so, and so that is an agreement, and it could be enforced as it is, but. As as a but contract, the, basically, right? As a contract, yeah. but but usually the the types of uh, uh, of uh, legal situations often require more more uh, affirmation in proper legal documents, and so the agreement says that the parties will have their lawyers create a more formal document. But this this these are the terms they agree on. So um, so the answer is yes. But we don't, we don't, I don't write up an agreement as if I'm representing everybody or one person or whatever. This is just a mediator's memorandum of understanding. However, it's an agreement and it's, an, and it's been held in for, enforceable. And it's been signed by everybody. So, right. and the last question is, it's a comp more complicated one. It's what if, if, if we agree on some things and, but there are some things, some decisions that we just can't agree on, even during the mediation, what happens there? So I'm gonna take a stab at this and then you can add something if you'd like, Jeff. That is not an unusual circumstance when people first come in to mediation. In fact, it's sometimes what brings them to mediation is that they're stuck, again, they're stuck. Um, our job is to help them hopefully get unstuck. 
and maybe divide up the number of decisions or help them think outside of the box about how they might resolve it. One case we had many years ago was one in which there was a family owned summer property after the parents died between his brother and a sister and the sister um, was married with a, with a child and the brother was gay and, and had a life partner with an, and a daughter. And um, they just couldn't agree on what to do. The sister had money, the brother had none. The brother felt like um, the community was, uh, that the house was in was very negative about the, um, about the, uh, uh, the, 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 the issue of, uh, it was homophobic. And so he didn't want to leave that house because that was an issue that really uh, represented something other than the house per se. We were able to settle that one, and I don't want to go into all the details of that, but I just want to, just using that example to say, they were arguing over different decisions, because in some ways, the brother really didn't want to own that house, but he wanted to make a statement, and he wanted access to the house, and the sister didn't want to cut him out, but wanted him to, um, wanted essentially wanted to buy him out and that was and eventually the resolution came when the sister in a private caucus told us that um, she had been the one who had had worked with the parents to allow um, them to accept him as gay and that made all the difference so we had different decisions being fought over and in the end something that wasn't directly about this decision made all the difference so um, people come in with disagreeing about, about certain decisions. That's what brings them to mediation in the first place. Jeff, you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think that was a good example of some of things that almost every family has below the surface. And sometimes, as of the two cases, the case we described in this, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, there's a, something that's good that's going on. There's appreciation there's uh there's solidarity um and sometimes it's 20 years old sometimes it's 50 years old but it's there and um it in it gets <clears throat> it's there and it hasn't been talked about and ultimately when we when it gets when it rises up in the mediation the brother had a whole different attitude about there are many many details in that case as well about the conflicts that had brought them in eventually so, okay, um, it has been a delight to, to create this um, webinar. Yes, um, I'm going to try one final thing, which I've never done before. If it doesn't work, um, remember we're the mediation group and feel free to call us. I'm going to try and share the screen now and um, put up our website. And I just want to say thank you for listening and participating in this process. And as do I. Thank you for. Um letting us share this with you. Yes. Okay, here we go. I'm going to try this now. Share the screen.